Okay, folks, since we are approaching the end of Donald Trump's presidency, I thought I should do this video uh, before it became just kind of a moot point and uh, fades back into the public's memory. And by the way, the Trump presidency is going to end. Please do not be one of the people out there who are saying Donald Trump will somehow remain in power past January 20th. Uh, there, there is no plan, so don't trust the plan. You need to steal yourself for a Biden presidency. So let's just get that out of the way. But before that happens, I want to take one more look back at uh, the initial hoax of uh, President Trump's presidency. And that would be the hoax par excellence, the fine people hoax. Now, the fine people hoax, if we want to define that, is the claim that in his August 15th remarks concerning the August 12th Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, President Trump called neo-Nazis fine people. So where did the media get that idea from? Well, it comes from this source quote. Excuse me, they didn't put themselves down as neo-Nazis, and you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. You had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally, but you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. Now, in the other group also, you had some fine people, but you also had some troublemakers, and you see them come with the black outfits and with the helmets and with the baseball bats. You had a lot of other bad people in the other group too. Okay, so right here in the source quote, we can see that Donald Trump, when he was talking about fine people, was not referring explicitly to neo-Nazis. In fact, he explicitly excludes neo-Nazis and white nationalists from that designation. He literally says, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists because they should be condemned totally. Okay, so how is it that the media took a quote in which, yes, he does say fine people on both sides, but explicitly excludes neo-Nazis and white nationalists from that fine de people designation? How did the media blow this up into a hoax in which he called neo-Nazis fine people? Well, they put two questions before the American public and they, they based their reasoning on this. First of all, what was Unite the Right about? Trump has his version in his mind of what Unite the Right was about. And he says, they wanted to protest the taking down of a statue of Robert E. Lee. So, excuse me, and you take a look at some of the groups, and you see, and you know it if you were honest reporters, which in many cases you're not, many of those people were there to protest this taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So this week it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall's Jackson's coming down. Uh, I wonder, is it George Washington next week? Is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? Okay, so it's pretty clear that in Trump's mind, Unite the Right was about the taking down of Confederate statues. And if that's the basis, then you can talk about both sides in being terms of the Confederate statue debate. You know, are there people who are not neo-Nazis and white nationalists who favor keeping the statue up? Yes, absolutely. Are there people who are opposed to the statues who are not violent? Yes, absolutely. And so if you understand that the sides that President Trump is talking about are the sides of the Confederate statues debate, and that you've got neo-Nazis on one side and fine people also on that side. And likewise, you've got Antifa on the anti-statue side and fine people on the anti-statue side. Then you understand what Trump is talking about. But the media, instead of going from the basis of what Trump was saying, went to what actually happened to be the facts. Now, this is from a Vox.com article called Trump's new defense of his Charlottesville comments is incredibly false. And it basically explains that Unite the Right was explicitly organized and branded as a far-right racist and white supremacist event by far-right racist white supremacists. This was clear for months before the march actually occurred, so by casting the rally instead as a sort of spontaneous outpouring from Confederate statue enthusiasts, Trump is rewriting history. Now, is Trump rewriting history, or does he just have a different view of the rally 
than what the media has. And granted, the media may be absolutely right. If, if you understand that, you can you can understand some of that, some of the uh, the media's spin. Because if the media looks at it and saying this was a white supremacist rally, you've either got pro white supremacy or anti white supremacy, then you can understand the media's horror that Trump would say that there's fine people on both sides. Because what he's saying is he's he's saying fine there's fine people on the white supremacy side and there's fine people on the absolute uh, the anti white supremacy side. But that's clearly not what the perspective that he was driving at. He was driving at the perspective of this is a Confederate statues rally, and there are people on the pro-Confederate statue side and the anti-Confederate statue side who are both fine people. So you have to get the sides right if you're going to get the debate right. And because the media insists on its view and doesn't look at Trump's view, and it instead thinks that Trump is speaking to the media's view, then there's there's no meeting of the mind. You can see how that kind of distortion of what Trump actually It does actually say each of these rallies was led and supported by uh, people who were apparently invigorated by an April 2017 decision by the Charlottesville City Council to remove a statue of Robert E. Lee from Lee Park. So even in their basically saying this was a white supremacist rally, they are admitting that the driver behind the rally was the removal of the Confederate statues. And so Trump was not entirely wrong about the rally being based on the Confederate statues, and so he's looking at it in that essential form and saying, okay, there's two sides of this debate. Who's on one side? Who's on the other? So let's break it down now into the people who are on both sides of Unite the Right. Now, in Trump's view, there are five groups, and he distinguishes these groups both on a set of beliefs, uh, whether they are neo-Nazis and white nationalists or not, and he also distinguishes it on whether they are violent or not. So going back to his original remarks, he talks about there were very fine people on both sides. You had bad people in the one group, and you had neo-Nazis in the one group, but you also had fine people in the one group. And then on the other group also, you had fine people, and you also had troublemakers with the black outfits and the helmets and the baseball bats. So he's talking about nonviolent people and violent people, and he's also talking about neo-Nazis and non-neo-Nazis. So who attended? In Trump's mind, there are five groups. There were the neo-Nazi white nationalist pro-statue protesters, and these were bad people. Then you have other pro-statue protesters who were violent. These were not neo-Nazis or white nationalists, they just uh, other pro-statue protesters who were violent. These were also bad people. Why were they bad people? Because of the violence. Then you had other pro-statue protesters who were non-violent, and these were some of the fine people in Trump's mind. Anti-statue protesters who were violent. This would be Antifa, the Black Bloc, the kind of, um, and when I say Black Bloc, that refers to kind of the outfits that they were wearing. That's not a BLM reference specifically. Uh, the anti-statue uh, protesters who were violent, those were bad people. And then you had anti-statue protesters who were non-violent, and those were fine people too. So if you look at things in terms of the Confederate statues debate, then you, have, you divide things into pro-statue protesters and anti-statue protesters, and then you divide those into violent and non-violent on both sides, and then on the pro-statue side, you also divide them into, you, you divide out the neo-Nazis and you label them bad people as well. So you've got violent bad people plus neo-Nazi bad people, and then you've got non-violent fine people on both sides. Okay, so that is Trump's version of who attended Unite the Right. Now Trump's critics will say there were only two groups there. There were neo-Nazi white nationalist pro-statue protesters, doesn't matter if they were non-violent, doesn't matter if they were violent, they're all bad people and they're all neo-Nazis. Okay. That is their view. And then, of the other group, you've got anti-statue protesters. And they're all fine people. I mean, you know, yeah, some were violent, but they were fighting Nazis. You know, they were fighting Nazis, so they were using violence to fight Nazis, and therefore it was good violence, and punching Nazis is good, you know, even if, the, even if some of the Nazis are being nonviolent themselves. Now, we've seen this kind of stuff all the time. We see, we see this kind of propagandistic characterization on the, the side of the left all the time. We saw some of it just in the last couple of days. 
Don Lemon uh, is doing the classic guilt by association thing by saying, if you voted for Trump, you are in the same crowd with the Klan and the Nazis. You voted for the person who the Klan supported, you voted for the person who Nazis support, you voted for the person who the alt-right supports, that's the crowd you are in. It's guilt by association right down the line. So the left has no trouble uh, lumping in all of the people on the pro-statue side as being neo-Nazi white nationalists because, hey, you know, that, that, that is the group you have chosen to associate with, so you will have the same classification in our minds as that. There's no finesse, no distinction, no, no, uh, uh, no subtlety, no, no understanding, no discernment. Likewise, on the anti-statue protester side, hey, we're just like World War II veterans. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, these people actually think that they're the new greatest generation because they're fighting a bunch of, you know, white nationalists in the streets of America instead of actually going off to um, World War II where they could have been, you know, shot and killed for their country. Ah, uh, goodness gracious. Now, you know, by the way, let's take a look at some of these original Antifa members and see what they had to say. Even comic book Antifa loved free speech. Now, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, very famous. They're the creators of the Avengers, uh, creators of uh, the Hulk. Um, I think there's probably some more. Oh, the creators of the X-Men. Very, very famous comic book creators. And they were very, very famous free speech advocates. Now, this is coming across in their comic books. Stan Lee writing, America, you know, writing in the character of a uh, Asian warlord who basically runs a dictatorship. And he says, America claims to be a land of freedom, and yet they allow the sons of the serpent to preach their doctrine of hatred and tyranny on every corner. Now, the sons of the serpent was a fascist group that was created by Stan Lee as a, as a uh, opponent to the Avengers. And one of the Americans says, that's part of our freedom, General. Anyone may say anything so long as he keeps within the law. You come with another American saying, you come from a land where countless thousands lived in abject fear, where they may not speak or read or even think as they please. And you talk of freedom. So uh, now you've got uh, uh, another scene from another one of the Avengers comics. All three of the Stan Lee uh, clips are from the Avengers comics, various issues. Um, and the Sons of the Serpents have this public meeting going on, and somebody in the crowd is saying, how do they have the nerve to hold a public meeting this way? And the guy says, remember, it's a free country. Any misfit, monkey, or mental case can hire a hall so long as they don't break any laws doing it. And then finally, Captain America himself says, that's the courage of a free country. Any man has a chance to sway us. Any man may be heard. And it's also our strength. It's the creed by which we live. So remember that uh, when, when you're talking about um, you know, Antifa fighting Nazis and stuff like that, that you've got Stan Lee, who was in the army during World War II, uh, as well as Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby was uh, a famous comic book artist, and, but he was also a writer. And this was one of his comics, The Fighting American. And it was mostly an anti-communist comic, but it also had a very strong free speech vibe. Uh, here we have the character Speed Boy saying, you dared us to come and get you, so we did. Well, now that you're safe here in America, why did you really want to come here? Was it to get all the comforts you lacked over there? What was on your mind? And this child who grew up in a communist country said, well, simply for that, Speed Boy, for the freedom to say what was really on my mind. You know, these two men who were Jews, who fought the Nazis in World War II, Jack Kirby, literally, uh, over overseas, uh, Stan Lee was, I believe he wrote uh, training documents in the army, but in their own ways, they both fought the Nazis. And they both believed in free speech. Now, Jack Kirby, there's a story that gets told about him, about how Nazis came to his workplace and he went down to fight them. Now, what people leave out about that story all the time, I mean, I got, I got like, raked over the coals when I brought up this uh, uh, particular cartoon on Twitter. They kept saying, yeah, well, Jack Nazi, or, I'm sorry, Jack Kirby <laughs> went down to, that was a slip, uh, Jack Kirby went down to uh, fight Nazis in, the, in, the, in his workplace. Yeah, well, those Nazis actually, you know, placed a call to him and, and verbally threatened him over the phone. They said, you know, hey, come on down here and we'll show you what uh, real Nazis would do to your Captain America. So he's like, okay, put down the phone, rolled up his sleeves, went downstairs. <laughs> but 
that's different from holding a First Amendment protected uh, public uh, uh, protest. It, it's not it, th going to someone's workplace and threatening them at their workplace is not the same as uh, free speech. Okay, so if you can't make that distinction, I don't I don't know how to address the kind of stupid that you're trying to push on people saying that, you know, well, Jack Kirby would have just favored punching Nazis in every forum. No, this was a very specific case, and it was specific uh, specific to him. And uh, But it doesn't have anything to do with First Amendment rights. So, yeah, the, these, uh, these greatest, this, the actual greatest generation, the actual original Antifa members, they were very big supporters of free speech, and I think their, uh, their views need to be respected. So here's something that we also have to consider. Was Trump lying about, you know, Charlottesville? Because, you know, when you go back and you look at, at Trump's view of Charlottesville and saying this was a statue protest and that the people on both sides were pro-statue protesters and anti-statue protesters, now he could have lied. He could have been lying about that. But here's the thing. Even Trump's critics don't believe that. In fact, in this heading where they are basically saying, no, Trump's absolutely wrong about the Unite the Right rally and the nature of that rally, they're saying, this is what Trump should have known. But they don't deny that he didn't actually know that. I mean, they, they don't deny that he was holding to the view that he espoused, that this was a statues debate rally. So, no, Trump was not lying. Trump actually held that belief in his head. And, and you can see this kind of thing throughout the Trump candidate, uh, throughout the recent Trump campaign when it came uh, to the fore that he had lost the election. Because if you look at his Georgia call, where he's talking to the Georgia Secretary of State and saying, you know, why is it you can't, uh, you can't do the audits that we're asking you to do? Why is it that you won't uh, make these challenges? Why is it that you won't question the certification when there's all this evidence on the table? You can tell from that phone call that Trump actually believes that these are valid claims of election fraud. Um, now, I think that's the result of his staff basically having told him largely what he wanted to hear. But that doesn't change the fact that his in his mind, this is what was going on. And so for the president to have a different view of reality than other people have is not uncharacteristic for him. For him to see the scene different from other people, see it in controversion of the facts, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, contradiction of the facts, sorry. Um, yeah, that's, that's not entirely uncharacteristic of him. So, was Trump lying? No. I mean, at worst, Trump just got it wrong. And uh, just going back to the comic book theme for a little bit, you have this scene here where uh, this is from a comic book called Marvels, and uh, the main character is a photographer named Phil Sheldon who has decided, you know what, I'm done. I'm done photographing superheroes. I've, I've done my part. I'm going to retire now, and I just want to deal with the normal world now. And so he, he invites up this paper boy, and he's like, hey, let's all have, have a... Uh, a picture taken with this nice, normal, ordinary boy named Danny Ketch, who would eventually go on to become the Ghost Rider. So <laughs> he would. <laughs> this was not the nice, nor ordinary, normal boy that Phil Sheldon thought he was. Uh, but who who knew? He didn't know. Uh, for all he knew, you know, there there was nothing different about this kid from anyone else. So, what really happened? Uh, what really happened is that President Trump condemned neo-Nazis and white nationalists, and he also condemned violent protesters on both sides of the Confederate statues debate. That's what really happened. And because President Trump condemned violence on both sides, he was accused of moral equivalence. And because President Trump praised nonviolence on both sides, he was accused of calling nonviolent neo-Nazis fine people, even though he explicitly excluded them from that designation on account of their beliefs. He didn't care whether they were violent neo-Nazis or non-violent neo-Nazis. They were neo-Nazis, and that was enough to say that they should be condemned totally. Now, at worst, President Trump was wrong about the purpose of the Unite the Right rally and the composition of the people in attendance during certain segments. In other words, he actually believed that there were non-violent pro-statue pro protesters who were not also neo-Nazis, and only those protesters, along with the non-violent anti-statue protesters, did he label fine people. Okay? 
Now, somebody might have said, wait a minute. Did you say nonviolent neo-Nazis? And I hate to break it to you, but yeah, this, what you see is the uh, torch rally from the night before the actual uh, Unite the Right rally. And this is one of the scenes that President Trump himself referred to, which, was con which did consist almost entirely, if not entirely, of neo-Nazis. This is a nonviolent protest. Just having torches is not violence, so long as you're not burning things down with them. Okay? You know, we've seen things burned down. This is not burning things down. Likewise, shouting loud, threatening, sounding slogans isn't violence either. You know, no justice, no peace, and pigs in a blanket fry them like bacon are also loud, threatening slogans, but they're just as protected. So, you know, let's look at nonviolent protests as the nonviolent protests they are. So, again, did President Trump call uh, neo-Nazis fine people? No, he did not. He was speaking about the Confederate statues debate and saying there were fine people on both sides of that debate. And that's it. So that is really all there is to say about uh, the fine people hoax. And I, I hope that we can leave all these hoaxes behind. You know, that, that's really something that when President Trump leaves office, we need to be able to focus on the future. We need to be able to, first of all, scrutinize Joe Biden and scrutinize the Democrats who now are in control of government uh, for what they are attempting to do. We can't cling to the past and say, oh, if only Trump had won. Um, that's, that's not a viable strategy going forward. We have to accept that Trump is a thing of the past, and now we have to look forward into the future and deal with what is to come. Because we're still in the throes of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we still we have the economy to worry about now. Uh, we have, we can only wonder what the Democrats will do to take advantage of the fact that they now have uh, all three uh, major seats of power in the Capitol. Uh, we need we need to focus on the future and leave and leave these hoaxes behind. So so I hope that going forward we can make a fresh start. And uh, one other thing, uh, speaking of, of peaceful protests, uh, there is a uh, idea going around that there are going to be protests at the various state capitals uh, throughout the country. Please make those peaceful. I mean, in every way, shape, or form, please ref refrain from any kind of political violence. You know, what we saw at the Capitol did so much damage to the president's brand, to the Republican Party's brand. The only thing that can come out of any kind of political violence is damage to your brand. Because it happened to Black Lives Matter, too. Black Lives Matter, so long as their protests were peaceful, you know, people were basically saying, yeah, this is a serious problem and, and we need to take it seriously. But when, when people started endorsing violence on that side, that is when support for the movement began to dwindle. And the attacks that were made on innocent people became an attack on their own brand. And whether it was BLM actually doing it or whether it was Antifa doing it and, you know, BLM reaping the, the sad consequences of Antifa's actions, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we all have to, to be united in nonviolence, you know. So if, if this is going to be any sort of unite the right part two, it damn well needs to be a nonviolent kind. I and, and it needs to be a... Uh, a, a peaceful protest that is denouncing the non-transparency of the election process so that going forward we can have the election transparency we need to feel confident about who we actually chose for our leader because there's still a lot of you know con uh, lack of confidence there's still a lot of uh, sentiment bad sentiment towards uh, the Democrats for this thought of having stolen the election. Um, we don't know if it's true. We haven't seen all the evidence. We haven't seen anything that rises to the level of proof. We need to, to have calm heads and we need to, instead of focusing on the past and trying to rectify past things, we need to try and rectify things going forward. We, try, we need to try and make the process as fair and transparent going forward as we possibly can. 
which I think is a philosophy that should be adopted by the fine people on both sides. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I think I'm going to wrap it up at that. And I'm Mike Partika. Thank you for watching this presentation. Uh, I hope we can go through the next four years with maybe a uh, lesser hoax incidences uh, so that maybe the media can start giving us some real news for a change and then we can all be on the same page and, uh, and start working on solutions to help move America forward into the future. So uh, please do subscribe if you haven't already and I will talk to you later.